Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first ever election debate focused on animal protection issues. My name is Holly Lake, and I will be your moderator this evening. I'm thrilled to welcome you all to this very special event. This has already been a groundbreaking election for animals. Animal protection has emerged as, as an election issue for the first time in Canadian history with party platforms, including promises about improving animal laws and policies. This debate is also making history of its own as it is the first time candidates have come together on the national stage to give Canadians a chance to learn more about their part, what their parties will do to protect animals if they're elected. And it's fair to say this is all coming together in a watershed moment for raising the profile of animal issues in this country. This debate is co-organized by several leading animal advocacy organizations, Animal Justice, the Montreal SPCA, Nation Rising, the Vancouver Humane Society, and World Animal Protection. On behalf of the organizers, I want to extend our gratitude to the three federal candidates who are joining us here tonight, from the Liberal Party, the New Democratic Party, and the Green Party. I'll introduce them in a little bit. It's worth noting that the event organizers did invite all parties to participate, all parties who have a seat in the House of Commons, I should add. However, the Conservatives and the Bloc Québécois were unable to send a representative tonight. Before I introduce our panel, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. I've already seen some of these questions flash by in the chat. First of all, um, the, the response to tonight's debate has been overwhelming and it has far exceeded the expectations of the organizers. Um, the event, for anybody who's here, know, you know that it is available for Zoom, it, it's, it's on Zoom. We were able to accommodate about a thousand participants here. If you know somebody who's unable to access the Zoom webinar, this is also streaming live on Animal Justice's Facebook page and on the debate website, which is www.animalelectiondebate.ca. And for our Francophone viewers, the debate is being translated simultaneously into French, and you can access that here on Zoom by selecting the interpretation option, which is at the bottom of the webinar screen. And you can also watch it live on um, the debate's website. And a third option is the French feed is streaming live on the Montreal SPCA's Facebook page. And if none of that is an option for someone you know tonight, the debate is also being recorded and that'll be posted on the debate's website um, probably as soon as tomorrow or tonight. <laughs> I don't handle the tech in. Secondly, um, a note about the format. Our hope here, I, I think it's safe to say everybody here is on team animal and our hope here is to have a civil discussion of the issues. That said, we know people have different views on some of those issues. So our plan is for me to ask a series of questions that have been compiled by the organizers and each candidate will have 60 seconds to answer each question. I plan to try and give you a wave at the 40 second mark. I'm going to do my best to remember to do that. Um, and once everybody has had their say, if, and I'll ask if anybody has a rebuttal and those candidates who do, they'll have 30 seconds to make that rebuttal. We're also reserving a period of time at the end of the debate for questions from the audience. And I have already seen some of those blow by in the chat. Um, here on Zoom, we're asking that you post your questions using the Q&A button that's at the bottom of the webinar screen, because we're not going to be monitoring the chat for question, the chat feed for questions. It just, it goes to, it goes by too quickly and uh, we don't want to lose any. On Facebook, you can also pose questions and you can do that underneath um, the live feed in the comment section. We're going to monitor both areas and our hope is to get to as many as we can during the audience Q&A period, but we are expecting a lot so I'm going to apologize in advance if we don't get to yours. Now to introduce our candidates. We'll start with Nathaniel Erskine Smith. 
He is seeking re-election for the Liberal Party in Beaches, East York, and he's been a vocal advocate for animals in Ottawa. In early 2016, Nate introduced the Modernizing Animal Protections Act to strengthen Canada, Canada's animal cruelty laws. Out of that effort, he helped found the Liberal Animal Welfare Caucus to push for humane transport laws and played a role in the Liberal government's introduction of laws to address animal fighting and sexual abuse and to ban the shark fin trade in Canada. Nate has also jointly seconded Bill S203 to end the captivity of whales and dolphins, supported the Jane Goodall Act, and introduced many animal petitions, including calls to stop supporting animal agriculture and to ban cosmetic testing on animals. He's also been an advocate for stronger climate action and has drawn attention to the impact a plant-based diet can make in tackling climate change. Locally, Nate has hosted a number of documentary and town hall events in his Toronto riding to raise uh, public awareness of animal issues. He was raised vegetarian and has been vegan for many years together with his wife, Amy Simington, and a a who is a vegan chef, a researcher, and a nutrition professor. And together they have two little boys, McKinley and Crawford. Our second candidate is Alistair McGregor, and he's the NDP candidate in Cowichan, Malahat, Langford. Alistair was first elected in 2015 and re-elected in 2019 to represent the riding. He's a strong advocate for agriculture, and he lives in Cowichan Valley with his family on a small farming property. He's previously served as the NDP's critic for agriculture and agri-food, rural economic development, and has been the party's deputy justice critic. He has also sponsored important legislation initiatives, including those which protect our soils and coasts. He's been a consistent defender of animal rights and championed greater protections for animals following a horrific case of animal abuse that occurred in his riding. Elizabeth May is the Green candidate in Saanich Gulf Islands. She has served as the leader of the Green Party of Canada from 2016 to 2019. She's the Green Party of Canada's first elected member of parliament and now serves as parliamentary leader of the Green Caucus. In 2005, Elizabeth was made an officer of the Order of Canada in recognition of her decades of leadership in the Canadian environmental movement. She graduated from Dalhousie Law School and was admitted to the bar in both Nova Scotia and Ontario. She practiced law in, in Ottawa and the pub, sorry, with the Public Interest Advocacy Center prior to becoming senior policy advisor to the Federal Minister of Environment from 1986 to 1988. For 17 years, Elizabeth also served as the executive director of the Sierra Club of Canada. A proud mother and grandmother, she lives in Sydney, BC with her husband, John Kidder, Elizabeth is also the author of eight books, including her most recent, Who We Are, Reflections on My Life and on Canada. And now to the questions. <laughs> We're gonna begin on the farm talking about agriculture. And specifically, we're gonna talk about regulations on farms. Each year, more than 800 million land animals are raised for food in Canada, by far the largest group of animals used by industry in this country. Though there's increasing awareness and concern among the Canadian public regarding the welfare of farmed animals, they have virtually no legal protection in this country. There is no federal legis legislation governing how they can be treated on farm, and they are excluded from key protections in, an in provincial animal welfare legislation. National codes of practice dealing with the care and handling of farm animals are developed by industry and strictly voluntary. Further, many practices that have been banned in the European Union and many, many states in the US, such as the uh, use of intensive confinement systems like gestation crates and battery cages, as well as systematic mutilation without anesthesia are still widespread in Canada. The question is, what would your party do to ensure an acceptable level of welfare for the millions of animals raised for food in our country? Ahead of the debate, we drew numbers to see who would go first. And that is you, Mr. Erskine Smith. You have one minute. Well, first, uh, thank you so much, Holly, but also 
thank you to everyone for joining. Thanks to the organizations for putting this together. And a special thank you to everyone who volunteers their time or work or looking after animals, protecting animals and caring for animals. Uh, on the, we're starting with the hardest question in some respects, because not only because it's where animal welfare runs up directly into commercial interests, but it is also because there are federal and provincial jurisdictional disputes around on-farm care. So typically we understand federal government having jurisdiction over the transport of animals and the slaughter for animals. And I would say liberal government did improve transport rules for animals, but very modestly, and I wouldn't hold that out as uh, something that we should be you know, patted on the back for as far as it goes. The, the best thing I, I could see over the last six years since I've been there in relation to the transport of animals was actually increase funding to train CFI inspectors. But we certainly need to increase fines such that they're not, not simply a cost of doing business. And I, I don't think any major party, we are thankfully touching on animal issues finally in platforms, but, but not engaging in this really serious issue. And the one piece of, the one commitment I should say in the Liberal Party's plan in relation to uh, food is specifically in relation to the live export of horses for slaughter, and that is something we are going to put an end to. And the other piece I should say is, I, I think we're going to see a lot more change and, and progress when we talk about reforming and transforming our food systems. And there's also a $1 billion commitment in the platform towards a national school food policy, which it's going to be critical to ensure that that is based and grounded in our plant-based food guide. I'll stop you there. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. McGregor, you're up next. You have one minute. Thank you. Uh, and a very important question. Um, I guess, first of all, I'd like to say that, you know, I come at this from a holistic perspective. You know, I, I have a small farming property and I'm really trying to practice uh, regenerative agricultural principles. Um, and that's a realization that, you know, in nature, uh, natural ecosystems, uh, balance requires um, a compatibility between plants and animals. And so when I'm raising animals on my farm, it's really trying to look after their natural instincts, make sure that uh, they are living to their fullest extent possible. When it comes to what the federal government can do, and, and I've talked about this uh, as part of my agricultural critic role. In fact, uh, during the agriculture committee meeting that we had just in June, I, I had a former top veterinarian from British Columbia on, and she said she would like to see uh, dedicated federal funding going to the National Farm uh, Animal Care Council, because right now it relies on grants. So if they could have that permanent funding and you know, actually maybe given some teeth so that they could set those national standards, I think that would be a very important initiative that we could do from the federal perspective. Thank you very much. Last but not least, Ms. May, you have one minute. Thanks, I'm gonna lose some of that time acknowledging that I'm in the traditional territory of the Sonic Nation and I raised my hands, Hachka, Sam. It's really fun. By the way, we're all friends here. So, you know, um, Nate, Alistair, good to see you. And for the conservatives, I just wanna throw out there because there's no conservative here. Normally, Michelle Rempel would step up and defend animal rights. We work as a caucus. It's not just a liberal animal caucus, but an all party caucus that Nate got going. And I hope we can get back to work in Parliament soon and figure out who has the lowest number to bring forward a private member's bill to start work. Uh, one of the things I like to say is we have to protect animals under the criminal code. That helps us get past some of the jurisdictional issues on farm that Nate has raised is to say mistreatment of animals and cruelty should be a criminal code offense, which makes it federal. We in our platform say this, quote, adopt comprehensive animal welfare legislation to prevent inhumane treatment of farm animals, set minimum standards of treatment, housing, density, distances, live animals can be transported. Yes, ban horse shipments to Japan and conditions for animals in slaughterhouses and auctions. Almost right on the nose. <laughs> I wondered if anybody had a rebuttal they wanted to make to anything either of the candidates had said. Someone's gonna say we really don't like each other that much and that'd be a lie. <laughs> Go ahead, Nate. I, I would say two things. One, Elizabeth is exactly right. We've moved our Liberal Animal Welfare Caucus into an all party format. And we had two meetings really, one around a One Health approach and the second one focused on this issue of live export of horses for slaughter. And so I was very thankful to see that 
in that platform and thankful for everyone who raised their voices on that issue in particular. The second thing I would say, Elizabeth is right insofar as we really need to drive legislation through private members legislation because finally parties are taking this seriously in their platforms, but it is slow progress, right? And if we're going to continue to see slow progress until people, you know, people need to continue meeting their members of parliament and raising their voices. But we as members of parliament, where we have the opportunity, need to table legislation. And in my own personal experience, when I tabled legislation in 2016, even though it wasn't successful, it really prompted a conversation in my caucus and the government then was seized with change. Yeah, and this isn't a rebuttal. Oh, sorry, Alistair. And, and I, I just wanted to add, like, I, just, I wanted to give Nathaniel a shout out, you know, um, C246 uh, was very proud to support that legislation. And I would agree with him that that did uh, start an important debate in Parliament, and I think maybe set the plate uh, for these issues to become more mainstream. Um, the criminal code is important, but we all have to remember that's a reactive piece of legislation. It only comes into effect after an offense has been committed. So that has to be part and parcel with, I think, guidelines set in place so that we are trying to tackle it, like be proactive. So the two, two pieces are needed, proactive and reactive. All right, let's look at climate change and food systems. The drought, heat waves, and wildfires that are sweeping much of Canada this summer are a stark reminder of the unprecedented threat posed to the planet by climate change. The United Nations says animal agriculture is directly responsible for at least 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions, yet meat consumption is climbing steeply on a global scale. Shifting towards a plant-based food production system and consumption is a major opportunity for emission reductions. The question is, does your party plan to invest in alternative proteins and cultivated meat? If yes, how does your party plan to encourage Canadians to eat more sustainably to help curb Canada's greenhouse gas emissions? On this one, Mr. McGregor, you're up first. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the amazing things I saw as a member of the Standing Committee on Agriculture was uh, some of the work that's being done in, you know, some of our food development centers, like in Saskatchewan, where they are taking pulses and uh, various uh, bean crops, and they're making new foods out of them. Because, you know, by themselves, these foods aren't very appealing, but they do have that high protein content, and they are alternatives uh, to animal-based protein. Uh, we, we have to be careful because you have to ensure that things like soy and various lentils are farmed uh, in, in a, a regenerative method that's, that's not doing more harm to the, to the environment because sometimes a, a lot of fertilizer and a lot of pesticides can be used, especially if it's massive monocultures. So you have to make sure that, you know, the, the way it's being farmed, like are they using cover crop? Are they using no-till? That's an important part of the puzzle. But yes, I, I salute the Canada Food Guide, which is asking for people to explore more non-animal sources of protein, because that of course is going to help our farmers doing those methods. But I would just ask consumers to just really pay attention to how those non-animal protein sources are being farmed, because that's a really important part of the equation. Ms. May? Yeah, we talk about changing the way we eat. I remember when I became vegetarian when I was 10 years old, that was like, I was the freak of the school. I mean, nobody believed that there was a person who actually didn't eat meat. They used to, classmates used to accuse me of going home at night in dark to eat hamburgers where people wouldn't see me. Why I would be abused by kids all day just to go home at night, but never mind. Um, we need, we are seeing a major, major evolution in people's awareness of the importance of plant-based diets. We are seeing an amazing response. I never thought I would think that McDonald's or A&W would be offering up meatless food. The transition and the way people are voting with their pocketbooks in grocery stores is amazing. Government can encourage this by taking away subsidies and really working to end industrial livestock operations, which are horrific on so many levels, but significantly, as you mentioned at the beginning, Holly, is um, about the third largest source of greenhouse gases after oil and gas and transportation. And we must move quickly to ensure that we respond to the climate emergency before it makes the planet uninhabitable. Mr. Erskine Smith, one when minute. I, when I called the climate emergency debate alongside Elizabeth May in 2018 in the wake of the IPCC's one and a half degree report, in the speech that I gave, I specifically emphasized 
how our diets make a difference. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to reflect on that and to change how we eat, but it's especially incumbent on governments to facilitate that transformation because we know that people aren't going to change. They are thankfully changing faster than I might've expected. You know, I was raised vegetarian and been vegan for a long time and it's about cost, it's about taste, but it's also about ensuring that there are, there are costs imposed elsewhere. And when we see industrial anim animal agriculture contribute to climate change the way it does, but we also see that it's a driver of pandemic risk. And so what can be done? Well, at the federal level, I would say a number of things. One, it's really important that this liberal government implement a science-based, plant-based food guide. Two, I mentioned the National School of Food Policy. We're going to help fund that food guide in schools, which can make a critical difference. And we've put $250 million in the last six years towards the plant-based food sector. There's much more to be done, which I might get to in a rebuttal, but we are taking important steps and we have to build on that progress. Does anybody want to make a rebuttal? Um, I, just one thing, I would say that when it, when it comes to agriculture, you have to remember that high inputs lead to high outputs. And I would encourage the audience to look at organizations like Farmers for Climate Solutions. Um, in fact, the high input model has doubled farm debt over the last 20 years. Many farms are just barely struggling to make it by. You know, they're spending 95% of their gross farm revenues on those inputs. So if, if we change to a style of agriculture where we are reducing pesticide inputs, reducing fertilizer inputs, and, and trying to change from that so-called factory style, it, it actually is going to be better for our farmers and for the long-term health of our agricultural sector. Ms. May? Yeah, Holly, if I may, I just wanted to say on the climate crisis, we have to make common cause with the agricultural community. There's a tremendous potential in soil for uh, carbon sequestration. If we move to a regenerative model, particularly, and I saw someone in the chat saying there's no regenerative animal agriculture, but let's, let's make sure that we're paying farmers to help them sequester soil, carbon in the soils, help them rebuild stuff that Harper got rid of, like the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Act to make sure that we're more drought resistant, that we've got hedgerows. We're looking at it, it, the farmers in this country right now are going through hell on earth. They can't grow things. They're, they're, it, it, the drought is punishing I mean, the heat wave and the BC being on fire this summer. I don't know what's wrong with the leaders of the other parties, sorry, for not focusing on the climate crisis and as the number one issue. Why 600 people, almost 600 people died in BC at the very end of June. That's an, another conversation, but we, we can't go at the climate crisis and demonize any portion of our society. We have to bring everybody on board, but we can't wait. So we have to regulate, we have to make the change, and we have to find ways that engage the agricultural community to be on board. That brings us to animal agriculture subsidies. The federal government currently doles out billions of taxpayers' dollars in the form of subsidies and programs that benefit intensive animal farming, which we've noted contribute to this country's greenhouse gas emissions. This creates an uneven playing field for the burgeoning Canadian plant-based sector. The question is, how would your party shift these subsidies away from intensive animal farming and invest in higher welfare farming and a plant-based food system? On this one, Ms. May, you are up first. One minute. Thanks. We were we we're pretty much um, picking up exactly where we left off. All subsidies from governments that lead to more greenhouse gases and an unsustainable planet must be stopped immediately. How do you do it? You take a red pen and you go through the budget and you cross out all of the federal dollars that go to tar sands, pipelines, intensive animal agriculture. You just eliminate them. And now the carbon tax is applied by the federal liberals right now exempts on farm use of diesel for as an example. Yeah, it, well, at some point it would be much better to create uh, locally built and managed biodiesel plants using the used chip fat from the McDonald's and A&W's I just mentioned. We should not be using farm crops that are grown for the purpose of biodiesel, but there are many ways to grab waste and use that so farmers can run their tractors without contributing to the climate crisis. 
Mr. Erskine Smith. So government has a greening government pledge. And the idea is where the federal government procures goods and services, they have to be consistent with our climate commitments. And I think the same should be applied, that same alignment should be applied not only on goods and services that we procure, and I've spoken to the Treasury Board folks to ensure that we are doing just that in relation to food policy in our institutions at the federal level. And that work is slow going, I would say, but, but it is in a conversation we need to continue to push. But similarly, sub, our, all, all federal subsidies, of course, should align with our climate commitments. And, and I would emphasize also with a commitment to One Health and this idea, this interconnectedness between human health, animal health, and environmental health, because we know that we need to reduce and prevent future pan we reduce pandemic risk and prevent future pandemics. And Holly, I don't know if, if I run out of time. No, not no. yet. So I, I would just emphasize a few different aspects because look, difficult political conversations around subsidies, not only in the fossil fuel sector, but also in industrial animal agriculture. But I would say there are also, in, I mentioned the food guide policy. I think there, there's also a way we can help fund colleges, institutes, uh, colleges and institutes Canada to ensure that every single culinary institution across this country has a, a culinary education system curriculum that is grounded in our science-based and plant-based food guide that we can improve regulatory our regulatory rules in relation to cell ag and i'll certainly be pushing if i'm reelected to, to help fund cell cellular ag agriculture as well that we need to put everything on the table and, and ensure that we find alternatives mr mcgregor yeah, I mean, obviously, it being the year 2021, uh, and and with all of the evidence of climate change around us, the the warnings that have been repeatedly made over the years that this is, in fact, the the most critical decade that we have to really turn things around. It's incumbent upon us to have truth in advertising. So a, a very real and very clear sector by sector analysis of emissions levels, and then we have to figure out what kind of policies and what kind of funding is actually going to reverse that trend. Um, on in agriculture, I mean, if you look at the the growing uh, importance and market share of organic agriculture, it is not getting the same amount of funding that is commensurate with its growing market share. And so I have long argued since I became critic in early 2018 that the federal government needs to put way more funding into organic agricultural research. I mean, we have got some amazing facilities right here in British Columbia. If anyone's gone to the UBC campus and looked at their experimental organic farm, they are looking for organic ways of producing pests, of, of pest management, of organic fertilize, fertilizers. The, this is the kind of stuff that we need to start investing in because, of course, it is going to have that all-important result at the tail end of reducing our overall emissions. Does anybody want to make a rebuttal? Go ahead. It's, it's, it's not a rebuttal. It's just to agree. Organic agriculture has many benefits, and we also have to look at how are we going to be resilient in the face of increasingly severe climatic events more droughts, more deluge rain events, um, and also more insect outbreaks. We need to break down what is a suicidal um, agricultural model that, that Agriculture Canada doesn't publish this, but clearly when you study the decisions that have been made at the federal level, the model that we are pursuing is for uh, massive exports of food-like stuff, not, not necessarily healthy food, and that, that is done in, for, uh, in bulk as opposed to um, small-scale farms, organic farms that can help produce healthy local food. So relocalizing and making sure that agriculture is regenerative within a local community. I know I'm going on too long, but it's a different model altogether. And the other aspect of food policy in Canada is it's all about cheap food, not healthy food. Mr. Erskine Smith, the floor is yours. Well, I want to build off that last point because so much depends upon cost. And if we want to transform our food systems and change the way that people eat for the sake of their own health for the sake of pandemic risk, for the sake of climate change, and of course, for the sake of animals, then we need to make sure that alternatives taste very good and are cost effective in comparison. And so we can have a challenging conversation around subsidies and there are difficult politics to it, but we need to continue to drive support for the plant-based sector. We need to build on the 250 million. We need to continue to build support for cell ag. And, and I would say we need to really focus the conversation as much as we can 
around what, what I what I consider the morality of convenience. I mean, people are going to change their views for all sorts of different reasons, but where they don't, because it is hard, and sometimes it is hard, and we have to make it as easy as possible. That's our job as governments, to make it as easy as possible for people to do the right thing, and we have to drive costs down for the plant-based sector. And I'll, oh, oh, go ahead. And I'll, I'll just add quickly, like, you know, for, in terms of animal-based agriculture, if, if we are going to build resiliency into the system, it does have to be that small, localized, community-based agriculture that can supply local markets. And, and I've been, uh, you know, banging the drum on building resiliency into the system. So the federal government can invest heavily in existing programs like the Local Food Infrastructure Fund, which helps those small companies get access to the capital they need to to build like a community kitchen or a local processing center that can help our small local community farms thrive survive and even expand their operations because those those small operations are usually the ones that are doing it right trying to do it in harmony with their local environment holly if i can there's a there's a side conversation going on on chat it says there's no such thing as regenerative agriculture. I just want to make it clear. This is about regenerating the soil to be healthy soil that sequesters carbon. It does not have anything to do with animal agriculture. It has to do with a way of farming to be regenerative for the health of soil. All right. Thank you for chiming in on that. Um, I'm watching the clock and the, knowing the number of questions that we have. I'm going to rein in the rebuttals for now. Um, I'm going to give you time at the end to share any final thoughts, but I do want to make sure that we get to the audience questions. So I'm going to halt the rebuttals for now. <laughs> I'm going to talk about ag gag laws now. There's been a trend recently towards what, you know, these so-called ag gag laws, which are agricultural gag laws being proposed and adopted in Canada. These laws uh, first spread in the United States and are designed to further decrease transparency in the animal farming system, often under the guise of protecting biosecurity. These can include bans on undercover exposés on farms. Right now, Ontario, Alberta, Manitoba, and PEI have ag-gag laws, and when this election was called, a federal ag-gag law, Bill C-205, died in the Agriculture Committee. The question is, what is your party's position on ag-gag laws, and what would you and your party do to address them? First up here is Mr. McGregor. Yeah, I can uh, definitely speak to C205. So I, I did vote in favor of sending it to the committee because I wanted to have a deeper, deeper exploration of uh, what the bill's intent was and what its uh, consequences would be. The most troubling aspect of C205 as it was written at second reading stage was that it was going to apply to people who were not there without lawful authority. So it seemed to be singling on a group of people. Now the Health of Animals Act, it, its main purpose is to prevent disease outbreaks. So if the bill was truly uh, centering on biosecurity concerns, I, along, I, I proposed an amendment that was gonna make the bill equally applicable to everyone, including farm employees and the farmers themselves. That amendment was accepted at committee, but unfortunately uh, this parliament died before the bill could go any further. Um, I think we do have to recognize that, that many farmers have had to deal with protesters entering their property. I'm certainly not in favor of anyone violating private property. Um, I think there's a right to protest, but it, it ends at someone's private property. And, and I think we need to respect uh, that particular aspect of it. Ms. May? Well, I, I certainly don't agree with, oh, sorry. I don't agree with the idea that you can't protest on private property. I was arrested at the gates of Kinder Morgan with Alistair's former colleague, Kenley Stewart. And I sometimes think you have to continue uh, to oppose things that are wrong. When they're wrong, they're wrong, even if you happen to have um, a, a piece of uh, legislation that will someday, or an injunction that will be thrown up by the courts. So I would just focus on the courts. I voted against C205. I'm very much against the idea that freedom of speech and the ability to collect the information about animal abuse is going to be made illegal. Um, and this is, someone asked what ag gag is, but of course, shutting down the ability of people who are working for animal rights to take those photos, to get that evidence, 
that should not be illegal. And I think there will be court cases and it will go to the Supreme Court of Canada. And, the, and these are laws at the provincial level so far. I want to stress C-205 was moved by a single conservative member. It was not a government bill. For Erskine Smith. I, like many of you, have seen horrific videos of wrongdoing and incredible harm and cruelty towards animals. And I'm thankful for the whistle, whistleblowers that took those videos. And I voted against 205. I would vote against any provincial legislation who was at that level when ag gag legislation rears its head. And I worked and, and advocated with my government to vote against 205. And the Liberal government did vote against 205. And I would say 205 is not the same as some provincial legislation, which is worse. But it is a statement we are making. It's a statement that we're making as federal lawmakers to basically say, we support this kind of legislation, which is redundant, by the way. We have trespass laws already. And so this is a statement to say, we are, we are making a statement against this kind of whistleblowing. And I think it's the wrong statement for us to be making. And so where this kind of legislation rears its head at the federal level, I'll vote against it. And, and the liberal government will continue to vote against it. I suspect this may come up in some of the audience questions, but we'll move on for now. Um, to the commercial wildlife trade, the COVID-19 pandemic has drawn attention to the links between the commercial wildlife farming and trade and deadly diseases. 75% of new and emerging infectious diseases over the past decade have originated from animals, principally from wildlife, including SARS, Ebola, and HIV. The wildlife trade is a top driver of pandemic risk, biodiversity loss, and animal suffering. Canadian demand for wild animals and products made from them fuels this trade. Between 2014 and 2019, at least 1.8 million wild animals were imported into this country from 76 countries, including from known emerging, emerging disease hotspots. Of those, 93% were not subject to any permits or pathogen, pathogen screening. The question is, what would your party do globally and nationally to address the impact of the commercial wildlife trade on animal welfare, public health, and biodiversity? Ms. May, you have the floor. Would ban, we would ban the commercial wildlife trade. There is no justification for what we've seen. And I think the pandemic is the moment and you set you, you made the preamble, Holly would take the points that I would wanna make. We know that this is um, a danger. It puts us at risk of greater pandemics. It's not appropriate to be taking wild, uh, wild animals and, and, and engaging in the trade. I mean, we have a precedent, we can do this globally. We have the, um, the Convention on the Trade of Endangered Species globally. We just need to extend that to a ban on the trade in, um, in wildlife species. And it's, it's uh, we can, as I said, base it on existing global treaties. And I think the time is right to do it if we bring it in strangely enough, not necessarily as an animal rights position, but as a public health position to avoid future pandemics. Mr. Erskine Smith. So this gets at that one health conversation that I referred to earlier. And there has been some progress. I can point to the shark fin trade and restrictions we put in place in the last six years. And I can point to a piece of legislation that was on the table and was coming out of the Senate and certainly is something we would have supported if it had come to the House, which was around the ivory trade. But I will say much more needs to be done around the commercial wildlife trade. We know this. We see a commitment in the platform to curb the illegal wildlife trade. And that's, that's important. Don't get me wrong. That's important. But I would say if you follow the evidence, we need to curb the commercial wildlife trade writ large. And, and I, I would ground the answer similar to Elizabeth. When we look at the United Nations Environment Program, when we look at the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Science, they, they call attention to the commercial wildlife trade as a major contributor to pandemic risk. Mr. McGregor. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna do a three-peat here and echo what uh, Elizabeth and Nathaniel said that absolutely I do support a ban on the commercial wildlife trade. 
Um, I believe I made a video for, for Animal Justice back in March uh, talking about, you know, how this commercial wildlife trade uh, has been linked to, to diseases like the SARS outbreak uh, in previous decades and including Ebola. And, you know, the further we venture into some of these pristine ecosystems around the world, the more and more in potential there is for us coming into contact with a truly novel and deadly disease. We also, and that's not to talk about the concerns we have about biodiversity loss, extinction. So absolutely, I, I think this is a very easy thing to say yes to. Um, and, and what remains to be seen in, in hopefully the next parliament and parliaments after that is a firm legislative commitment to an act that will uh, with strong uh, action. Thank you all. We're gonna look offshore now for a moment. Former Senator Murray Sinclair has recast the need for stronger animal laws as a matter of reconciliation, emphasizing that indigenous worldviews prioritize animal and environmental protection. It is noteworthy that indigenous senators, particularly Senator Sinclair, have been some of the, been some of the driving forces behind animal protection laws in the Senate in recent years. To highlight just one example, Indigenous leaders have observed that fish farms produce biological waste that damage, the local ecos that damage local ecosystems, and that they use locally caught fry as fish feed, which diminishes fish stock, uh, fish stocks for used for substance in First Nations. Fish farms also rely heavily on antibiotics to keep disease at bay in overcrowded pens, which can lead to drug resistant illnesses in humans. They also pose risks to the marine environment and wild species in the sea. The question is, how will your party address the current problems surrounding aquaculture? Mr. Erskine Smith, you are up. First, before getting to the question, I, I wanna emphasize what Murray Sinclair Claire says about the Indigenous perspective, because it, it's critical. We saw with the bill that was sponsored initially by Liberal Senator Willie Moore, and then Murray Sinclair picked it up, and ultimately Elizabeth May brought it to the House. We saw commercial interests weaponize the Indigenous perspective to say that the bill would have an impact on Indigenous rights when it clearly wouldn't, and Murray Sinclair was there to shut it down, but also to bring that, that idea of stewardship and that idea of the importance of putting animal welfare into the reconciliation conversation. On aquaculture in particular, I would say, I, I'm running out of time, so I, I may have to summarize it later, but I, I'll put it in the chat. But there is a, a commitment, and, and I'm thankful for the advocacy, really, of, of our BC Liberal Caucus, and it's important to have strong Liberal Caucus voices, I would say, on this, but they have very much pushed the government, and the government has begun to take steps, and I'm out of time, but I will post some stuff in the chat. Well, a hat tip to you for sticking to the time. <laughs> Mr. McGregor, the floor uh, is yours. Yeah, on aquaculture, uh, you know, the, the federal NDP has been leading on this issue through several parliaments. You know, I have to tip my hat to Finn Donnelly, the former MP for uh, the Coquitlam area. He had uh, private members bills in previous parliaments that was seeking to establish that transition from open net fish farming to closed containment land-based systems, which now are commercially viable options. I live on the West Coast. Our wild salmon, I mean, it runs in our blood here, the health of wild stocks. Uh, I live in a territory that is home to many traditional territories of First Nations, particularly the Cowichan, which is the largest uh, Indigenous nation in British Columbia. And in fact, their partnership with the local uh, Cowichan Valley Regional District has led to some amazing initiatives be done for the Cowichan River, which has actually improved our wild Chinook stocks and is a model of how we can have that kind of local Indigenous and non -Indigenous Indigenous governance models for the rest of British Columbia. And I'm very proud that that work's going on in my writing. Ms. May. Thanks, Holly. This is uh, for, for all of us in British Columbia, a critical issue. We allow, my, my constituents in town hall meetings said to me a, a lot of years ago, let's just stop calling them fish farms. That sounds almost benign. Let's call them what they are, toxic fish factories. They release disease and sea lice. They compete with the wild salmon. They are pollutants. They are not aquaculture. They are 
Well, that we should get them out of the water immediately. The liberals promised that in the 2019 platform. And then they began, I'm afraid to say that Bernard Jordan as minister began to say, oh, well, it's not to get them out of the water by 2025. It's to have a plan to get them out of the water by 2025. No, we have to get them out of the water now. A lot of those um, operations are owned by Norwegian companies. Norway has banned putting them in open net situations. Get them out of the water now. And by the way, Canada is the only country in the world that has licensed GMO fish for aquaculture and human consumption. And we need to deal with that in the upcoming parliament under SEPA. And I'm out of time. <laughs> you are. I'm going to take you back to the farm. COVID-19 has spread like wildfire in mink farms across Europe and the US. And there have also been outbreaks in British Columbia. Fur farming has been criticized as inhumane, but it also poses a serious risk in facilitating the spread of COVID-19 to people and to native wildlife. The Union of BC Indian Chiefs has called for an end to fur farming in the province. The question is, are you concerned about this? And if so, what would you and your party do to address it? Mr. McGregor, you have the floor. Yeah, this is particularly concerning. I mean, we we have long worried about those uh, particular diseases which can make that jump from humans to animals, and and when you are you know farming uh, pigs or or mink in this case, there is a very strong possibility that that can happen, and it did happen. And so, in response to to you know what we're going to do about it, of course, you have to look at the way the animals are farmed because it could be mink in this occurrence, it could be pigs in another occurrence but it comes to the way they are farmed. Diseases can spread so much uh, in, in a much easier way when they are in close cramped conditions. And so it comes down to those standards you have to put in place when you are doing animal farming. You have to make sure that you know, those national uh, guidelines are put into place, but that they actually have teeth in them and that the, the organization that's responsible for overseeing it has dedicated funding in order to pursue uh, and make sure that those are being enacted. Ms. May? I think there's less and less question around the question of the um, intensive fur farming. The mink farms are clearly now tied to pandemic. They're not sustainable. It doesn't make sense. But the whole issue of fur is problematic. I know we're the only party right on this platform that opposes the largest industrial slaughter of animals in the world, which is the, um, the seal hunt. We need going back to the question around indigenous perspectives to ensure that we're protecting indigenous rights. They are rights to uh, hunt and fish. We need to make sure that that is protected, but with a consciousness around um, compassionate treatment of all life. This is not an easy thing, especially in 60 seconds, but I think we have to confront the fact that the government of Canada continues to massively subsidize the slaughter of seals and we could find a way, I believe, to work with Indigenous peoples to ensure sustainable and compassionate pursuit of, of wild fur, but shutting down fur farms. Mr. Erskine-Smith, the floor is yours. The fur farming industry is increasingly small in Canada and for good reason, because Canadians are turning away from this industry for good reason. Companies are turning away from this industry for good reason. And the federal, the federal government should put an end to this industry once and for all. And it's not to say you leave farmers out in the cold. We can transition farmers. Again, it is a small industry. We can transition farmers to new opportunities. And we know we can do this because other countries have done this. Many other countries have done this. Countries like the UK have had legislation to prohibit fur farming for a very long time. And they allowed for a transition period and they financed the transition to ensure that farmers weren't left out in the cold. It's very possible. It's something we should do. And it's actually an issue. I have a bill I haven't tabled yet, but I worked with the legislative drafters to put a bill together to do specifically this at the federal level. All right, we're going to switch gears again. I'm watching the clock. <laughs> we're going to move on to entertainment. Each of your parties helped achieve major progress in 2019 by passing the so-called Free Willy Bill, which outlawed keeping and breeding whales and dolphins in captivity in Canada in the future. Yet there is more work to do. 
videos continue to emerge depicting troublesome conditions at Marineland, including a video last week that showed Orca Kiska, who was grandfathered by the new laws ban, slamming her head against uh, the side of her tank. And in the last parliament, then Senator Sinclair introduced the Jane Goodall Act aimed to outlaw the captivity of elephants and great apes. The question is, what else would your party do to build on this progress and further restrict or end the use of wild animals for human entertainment in Canada? Ms. May, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the fact that um, Nate mentioned I was the sponsor of S203 in the house. And I want to, this is an extraordinary thing that didn't get a lot of note that in banning the keeping of whales, dolphins and porpoises in captivity, we also created a standard for the first time that asks government to consider the well-being of an individual animal. It's the first time we've actually taken into account the suffering of an individual animal as a sentient being. And that's in the context of exceptions to when you can take a whale or dolphin into captivity around what's in the best interest of that individual animal in the case it's injured or needs treatment. We do need to go farther. We need to go much farther in looking at um, banning entertainment uh, events. And there's a strong public demand to end, for instance, the chuck wagon races at the Calgary Stampede. Not to ban the stampede, but to eliminate those elements like calf roping that clearly involve animal cruelty, while we're also, and I think it's important to celebrate the culture and protect uh, a, a big, a very popular community event. Mr. Erskine-Smith. I have been to Ottawa one for one night since this pandemic began, and I'm thankful for all the staff who stood up virtual in Parliament. And I went because I had the opportunity to participate in a press conference with Jane Goodall and Marie Sinclair in relation to the Jane Goodall Act. And in the Liberal Party's platform, we commit to introduce legislation to protect animals in captivity. There's also a reference to curbing the illegal wildlife trade around uh, elephant and rhinoceros tusk and ivory. And those are both specific references to the Jane Goodall Act. And we will introduce legislation to protect animals in captivity. And we will, I, I will work as hard as I can. It's not specifically in the platform, but it's referenced in the platform. I will work as hard as I can to ensure that the Jane Goodall Act becomes government legislation. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Yeah, I, I think the, you know in in the in the parliament where the the bill that banned uh, whale and dolphin uh, captivity was passed, I think that was it was pretty awesome to see the multipartisan effort to get that bill across the finish line, and and it, it was fantastic to see. And and yes, we do have to go further. I mean, when we're talking about animal welfare, one of the big things is how the animal is doing psychologically. And you know, when you see animals in captivity, uh, they are not displaying their natural wild behaviors. Um, you know, if they're bumping their heads against the wall, if they are displaying extreme boredom, completely uh, unnatural behaviors, absolutely, I am in favor of us following up, strengthening those types of laws. And absolutely, I do, you know, I, I salute Senator Murray Sinclair for that Jane Goodall Act. I think that's the type of leadership we'd like, we, we need to see in Canada. And I'm looking forward to seeing such legislation if I am elected in the next parliament. I want to turn to companion animals. Currently, animal sheltering, rescue and rehabilitation are largely left to private territory private charities and volunteer based organizations in Canada. A lack of funding in, in the animal services sector puts staff at risk at bur of burnout, and it makes it difficult to address the causes of animal suffering, such as systemic barriers people face in caring for their pets. The question is, how will your party support essential animal services like animal shelters and wildlife sanctuaries so that they have the capacity to address and prevent ongoing issues causing animal suffering? Mr. Erskine Smith, the floor is yours. Uh, so first, I should say, because I forgot to say in answer to the last question around Kiska, we absolutely should have in reference to sanctuaries. We have, you know, there was a grandfathering provision and it made sense because there wasn't an alternative. We should create the alternative. And there's an opportunity in Nova Scotia to have a whale sanctuary and ensure that marine land is properly shut down and the whales there are sent to a sanctuary. In, uh, in relation to the 
companion animal conversation, we have just, look, provincial governments ultimately are the lead on this, but we at the federal level have recently given $700,000 to Humane Canada. It used to be the Federation of Canadian Humane Societies, specifically to support women and children fleeing domestic violence who have companion animals. So we are finally getting into the game of supporting directly through federal funds and not through provinces, directly supporting institutions that are that are that are caring for animals and supporting people with companion animals. The, the last thing I will say, and it's a personal view and I haven't seen it yet from the federal government, but we but we do need to support enforcement as well. We have strong rules at times, not we need to strengthen those rules too, but we also have to strengthen enforcement. Mr. McGregor. Yeah, my, I mean, when it comes to companion animals, I mean, we, we had a very brutal uh, case of animal abuse in my riding. It was a, a dog that had been tethered uh, to a pole uh, when it was a puppy and, and no one had ever bothered to loosen the collar as it grew into an adult dog. And so the, the collar actually was stuck in the skin and, and that was Teddy the dog. So I, I am on side with Nathaniel on this, you know, in terms of enforcement of animal cruelty laws, um, we, we definitely need to see the criminal code step up to the plate in that. But uh, I am in support of, of organizations that can help promote the use of companion animals. I think particularly with like veterans who are suffering PTSD, there has been, there's a great body of evidence that companion dogs and even parrots, because parrots can live up to 70 years of age. So they will be there for the duration of the veterans life and they can actually have some incredibly beneficial effects to people who are suffering from past trauma. So there, there's, there is room for conversation here, but at the end of the day, we have to make sure that the animal's welfare and caring is a top priority if we are going to go through with these different roles. Ms. May. Yeah, thank you. I think it's um, Gandhi who said that the, you can judge the civilization of a human society by how it treats its animals. Our, the way we treat animals in Canada is uh, not acceptable. We And we need to get, as I started my first statement, we need to get this within the criminal code. That's where we can protect companion animals from cruelty. We can, in, right now, and, and I think everyone on this call knows this, animals of all kinds are treated as property. And therefore the cruelty to the animals is, is a matter of a private property prosecution, as opposed to what it should be recognized as. People who torture animals are dangerous to society. Animals matter, but let's take it to the level of getting the police on board. Police will tell you that somebody who's going to be found guilty of murder down the road of a human being probably was also involved in torture of animals. If we take it more seriously and we put in place criminal code sanctions against cruelty to animals, then we'll start seeing progress. I'm going to continue with talk of companion animals, um, but with a slight twist. Since the beginning of the pandemic, Canada has seen a surge in the demand for companion animals as more people are spending time at home, people are living alone, and they're seeking out the companionship of dogs, cats, and other animals, perhaps parrots. And this sudden explosion in demand has translated into increased purchases from online sources, including unethical breeders that keep their animals in substandard conditions, which we've come to know as puppy mills. The pandemic pet boom has also resulted in an increase in the number of puppies imported into Canada for sale, sometimes in alarming conditions. And one notable case that made the headlines, um, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency confirmed that a flight from the Ukraine arrived at Pearson with, a with about 500 French bulldog puppies on board, 38 of which were found dead on arrival and dozens more that were dehydrated and seriously ill. The question is, what would your party do to curb the unscrupulous breeding of companion animals in Canada and to address the problem of companion animal imports? Mr. McGregor, you have the floor. Well, I mean, it really comes down to, to enforcement. I mean, we, we need to make sure that uh, dog breeders uh, are operating with a license and that their facilities are inspected regularly. In, in my uh, hometown here in Duncan, we did just have a puppy mill uh, investigated by the police. It, it, the problem was is that the neighbors all knew that this had been going on for years 
And, and that's how long it took for the RCMP to finally arrive and shut the place down. And, and meanwhile, in years, all of these Shih Tzu puppies were being bred again and again and again in, in very poor conditions and being sold. So, you know, the, the length of time it took from the first set of complaints to actual enforcement action was far too long. So, so we do need to beef up enforcement measures, regular inspection, and to make sure that, you know, when you are breeding companion animals, you are doing so in a way that respects all of the tenets of basic animal care and decency. Ms. May? Sorry. Yes, I mean, what the, I was so pleased, uh, and I'll just call, uh, shout out, I'm sure this was um, Michelle Rempel's work to see the Conservative Party platform include banning puppy mills. And I, th I think I'm right on that. I was taken aback because that's exactly where we are as Greens. We, th you have to actually regulate the conduct that you don't think is going to be acceptable. And I think through pandemic, there've been a number of exposés and mainstream television about puppy mills, about shutting them down, about how, how egregious the operations are, as opposed, you know, so it's, um, oh, I'm getting distracted by chatter. Yes, Nate is <laughs> vegan, so yay, Nate. <laughs> and I've been working on it. It's so a very busy chat. Puppy mills is the best way <laughs> I know banning puppy mills is the best way to make sure that abuse stops. And I go back to federally, the only way to do that is to start putting protection of animals and their well being in the criminal code. Mr. Erskine Smith. So, a few different things. One, I think it's really important to identify some of the progress we've made. And it's not been perfect, of course, and it's slow going at times, but we have made significant progress since 2015 in comparison to any other parliament that I've certainly seen in, in Canada. And one of the changes recently in May of this year, there, the rules were strengthened in relation to importing animals for resale. And so as an example, an import permit must be issued by the CFIA accompanied by a veterinary certificate of health issued by a veterinarian. So it's, the, the system isn't perfect. And we've seen obviously some, some terrible stories in the news, but it, it has been strengthened recently. And on puppy mills in particular, I've spoken to Minister Lametti. He actually, he's got a mandate letter from the prime minister, but he's given a mandate letter to his parliamentary secretary that includes animal welfare and includes animal protections. And this is a conversation he wants to pursue. And really it comes down to fundamentally, I'm glad to see the conservatives identified as an issue to pursue. It really ultimately comes down to federal and provincial jurisdiction and hammering out where the gaps are and, and how we can improve the laws and, and close those gaps. All right, we're at our final question before we go to the audience questions. And we're gonna talk about cosmetic testing. Your parties have all gone on record as supporting a ban on cosmetic testing on animals. Although we saw no action on this in the last parliament, despite a bill that, had, that would ban the practice having received support in the Senate and being sent to the house where it did not move. However, animals used for cosmetic tests represent only a small fraction of the animals used in science. Looking at the bigger picture, there are no national legal standards and no federal inspections or oversight of animal research in Canada. The government has instead allowed a private nonprofit called the Canadian Council on Animal Care to impose voluntary standards and provide some oversight, yet it lacks law enforcement power. The question is, what would your party do what would your party commit to, uh, sorry, I'm gonna try again. Would your party commit to creating enforceable federal standards and providing oversight to ensure animal welfare and transparency in animal experimentation? Are you committed to supporting alternatives to animal research? Ms. May, you have the floor. Thank you. I don't have to worry about what my party says on this it, it, because we've already taken a position against all animal testing and we want to make sure that the regulations around and not just for the, we, our policies as a party come from our membership. Members voted years ago that that is a policy of the party to end animal testing, not just cosmetic. Now, so some of those, not all policies end up in every platform, but I don't have to work to make that the position of the party. It is the position of the party. I do think as a matter of, of practicality as a parliamentarian, 
moving forward to demand that there be not voluntary committees made up that are heavily weighted towards the industries that want to do the animal testing and towards a, a medical model of research that regards animals as dispensable. I think we, we definitely need to have stronger standards until the day when we can absolutely not be using animals in testing. Mr. Erskine Smith. So first in reference to the chat, someone suggested I'm in the wrong political group. And I would say I'm not the only liberal member of parliament who's fighting for animal rights and animal protections. We have an animal welfare caucus within the liberal party started by myself and Alexander Mendez, but Deb Schultz is an incredible voice for animals in King Vaughn. Pam DeMoff is an incredible voice for animals in Oakville. Julie DeBruzen is an incredible voice for animals. Arif Varani, both in Toronto and Toronto Danforth and Parkdale High Park. It really is about sending strong animal protection candidates to parliament and including in the Liberal caucus. And on this issue in particular, this is a really good example. Dozens of us signed a letter to the government. Internally, it was an internal caucus discussion and we called for an end to cosmetic testing and to phase out all animal testing. And you know what's in our platform? We're gonna introduce legislation to end cosmetic testing on animals as soon as 2023 and phase out toxicity testing on animals by 2035. That's what happens when you have animal friendly voices in parliament and in the Liberal Party. Mr. McGregor. Uh, yes, the short answer is yes, I do support a, a ban on cosmetic testing on animals. Um, the bill you referenced from the 42nd Parliament, that was Bill S214. And it was a shame to see it languish for so long in the Senate. Uh, and when it did finally arrive to the House of Commons, I mean, it, it was June of 2019. And, and we were basically at the end of that Parliament. So it's unfortunate that so much time has passed since then. And, you know, I'm, I'm very much hoping that we do do see a renewed commitment to legislation from, from whoever forms government uh, in this next 44th parliament, because that is something I am absolutely committed to supporting. All right. So <laughs> we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. And we would like this to be a little less structured. Um, once you hear the question, please signal if you want to answer, and I will call on you. And I'm just looking to see if I have been fed any questions yet. And I have not. <laughs> Let me see. I have more questions myself, so don't worry. We won't have dead air. <laughs> okay. Let me go to some of those. I want to go back to cultivated meat. Globally, meat consumption is the highest it's ever been. According to the UN, global meat production is projected to double by 2050, 2050. With plant-based meat, cultivated meat, and fermentation, there is a huge opportunity in terms of addressing food insecurity while, while reducing greenhouse gas emissions and public health impacts from industrial animal agriculture. What is your party's position on investing in the cultivated meat sector, both in terms of research and development, but also in terms of business initiatives and startups? Ms. May, I'll let you kick this one off. What uh, we absolutely in our last platform and in this one call for an end to industrial livestock operations. And of course, we, we, vastly, we very much support the alternatives. We, we have to recognize that around the world, the, the increased consumption of meat is part of driving the climate crisis. It's also an aspect of as people become more, uh, as developing countries where people have been acutely poor, the, the meat consumption is also on the rise because it's a sign of, of getting out of poverty. We need to, we need to really communicate in ways that are respectful that eating less meat, I think that's the right way of point of entry say you have to eat less meat. If we're going to survive on this planet for animal welfare reasons, for biodiversity reasons, for climate reasons, and then here's some alternatives. So promoting the alternatives and helping with the research to the extent that the private sector needs it. But this is a growing sector and very profitable. 
Mr. Erskine Smith. Singapore was recently the first country to bring a cell ag product to market. The USDA and the FDA have a partnership as of March 2019 to establish regulations to allow this kind of innovation to happen. And there's money in the private sector starting to flow, small, but we see Cargill and, and where there's money to be made, companies are going to make money. And we have to get out ahead of this. This is a way we need to put everything on the table. I think I said it before, but this is a moonshot approach of sorts, but we need to take these kinds of moonshots, both for the sake of animals, for the sake of climate, for the sake of pandemic risk. And there are two avenues here that I think are critical. One is the regulatory system. It's a conversation I have had with my colleagues and I will continue to have. And two is on the R&D. So we've provided $250 million for the plant-based sector. There's an organization, New Harvest, in the United States. And the executive director of New Harvest ha actually happens to be a Canadian, but they're involved in cell ag in the R&D space. We need to put money on the table through the, whether it's super clusters or the, the we have a significant amount of funding for R&D through innovation. And we need to use some funds at least. And it's not a lot that I've seen asked for, $30 million or so, but we need to put money on the table to make it happen. All right, Mr. McGregor. Yeah, and, and to, to add what to Elizabeth and Nathaniel uh, said, um, I, I think also it's really important that uh, consumers need to be educated um, really on how their food is produced, right? Because I find that there is a huge disconnect between consumers and how uh, our food is farmed. So we do need to strengthen those ties between consumers and farms so that they do have an informed understanding of the food miles, uh, how your food was produced, and so on, and and you know to add what to, to what Nathaniel said, I, I think like local is always better if we're trying to tackle the the climate crisis. So building resilience into our communities, building up those local food hubs and distribution centers, that's really what's going to be make us able to withstand the next pandemic and and any kind of disaster that comes our way because. The most, the thing that's most at risk is the long supply lines and, and the the consolidation that large corporations have over this market. We're in, in in our chat. We're getting a lot of questions about the live export of horses for slaughter. Um, this is something that has been taken. The Canadian Horse Defense Coalition has taken the food Canada Food Inspection Agency to court um, for failing to enforce its own laws for years around headspace, around how the animals, the, the containers that they're shipped in, with no segregation. What would your what is your party's position on this, and what do you think needs to be done on this front? Is this something that needs to be banned, or is this an area where it's simply a matter of following the rules that are on the books? We're into audience questions now, so raise your hand and uh, we'll go from there. All right, Nate, you can go first. This is in the Liberal Party platform. <laughs> so in, in order for it to get there, first, I just wanna thank every advocate from Jan Arden to every member of the Canadian Horse Defense Coalition, everyone who raised their voices, and then my colleagues. Elizabeth May being a member of our All-Party Animal Welfare Caucus who certainly raised her voice, but also Marie-France Lalonde in Ottawa, Alexandra Mendez from Quebec, Julie de Bruzen and Pam DeMoff, who I've mentioned previously. And, and I can't emphasize enough the importance of having voices like theirs in our parliament and, and uh, you know, biased as I am, but in our Liberal Party. And as a result, we do see another commitment to ban the live export of horses for slaughter in black and white in our platform. Anybody else want to jump in on this one? Yeah, I tried, I tried to get in there. Um, it's also in our platform to be in the section I read, which is detailed, but the banning of the uh, export of live horses that is uh, urgent. Uh, and again, a shout out to the activists and particularly our friend Jan Arden, who's awesome with the horseshit campaign, excuse my language, but that's what it is. And we really need to continue to push all parties. And I really hope when we get back to parliament, we can put the uh, all party, and let's I say when, if and how we get back and whoever it is, who cares about animals is back. Whether I'm in parliament or not, I'll keep working to get that all party animal caucus working to move to get bills passed. It shouldn't take so long, but if it's a minority parliament, honestly, we have more clout. Each individual MP has more clout when no one has a false majority based on the perverse first past the post system. Thank you. Go ahead. 
Yeah, and, and if I could just add, like we, we have to ask the question, why, why is this happening in the first place? Uh, you have to look at the, the companies that have a stranglehold on this market, companies like Cargill, like JB, and, and for them, you know, it's about economics. That, that, this is the, the black and white reality we have to confront. So you, you have to really, if we're going to make positive progressive change in this, we have to tackle the stranglehold that large multinational corporations have on this market and really you know that's going to be key to, to getting to a ban on the live export of any animal in this whole system. Yeah, I spoke I spoke to the lawyer that was representing the coalition uh, last week, and her position was, you know, like this isn't really a partisan or a political issue. There are a small number of players making a large amount of money on this, and uh, for that reason, she seemed to think, you know, this should be a a bit of a no brainer. So. We're going to move on to sled dogs. This is something that's been raised quite a bit in our very, very, I, I don't, I'm not sure if I've ever seen a busier chat on a webinar than <laughs> this one. It's been on fire. So the next question is, the sled dog industry has been criticized for years for keeping dogs in troubling conditions, including living their lives on the end of a short chain, being denied social opportunities with other dogs, and being forced to pull heavy sleds for entertainment. What would your party do to protect dogs from this industry? And this is, again, jump in, raise your hand or just start talking. I mean, it's, it's, I hate to keep repeating the same answer, but it is a very comprehensive change when we do it. We just say animals are not property and the protection of animals against um, cruelty is in the criminal should be in the criminal code that one step uh, will make an enormous difference that's why it's so vigorously opposed and we know that as good as nate's bill was it was the farming agriculture caucus within his party that decided to raise concerns i think it's very important to distinguish between um, cruelty and ways to engage in animal agriculture that avoid cruelty. Now, some on this chat will be completely opposed to that, but if we're gonna make progress for animal rights, we have to be prepared to say we're talking about overt cruelty. There are standards under the European Union that allow animal agriculture, but not in spaces that amount to cruelty. And we definitely should ban immediately the, the mega hog factories that keep sentient creatures like pigs in containers they never see the outdoors their entire life. And that also creates manure lagoons, which are a major threat to water quality. There's so many issues here, but I know I'm going on too long. I would say two things. I mean, first, the criminal code is there to go after intentional animal cruelty and it obviously should be improved to go after gross negligence as well and that was one of the changes that was in past liberal government bills was was in my bill as well and i think it's a change that is sensible we, we have gross negligence offenses in other parts of the criminal code but it's not a perfect answer to distinct areas of activity like sled dogs for example where obviously where you see cruelty that would qualify under the criminal code then that's for enforcement, or if the criminal code is weak, we need to improve the criminal code. Otherwise, and this is why you see calls in BC and, and elsewhere for provincial regulations to be strengthened, is because we do need to not put it all on the federal government, and we do need all levels of government to work together to strengthen animal protections. Go ahead, Mr. McGregor. I'm not going to profess to be any sort of an expert on, on, on the sled dog industry. I'm about as far away as you can be from Canada's north. Um, but again, it, it, I think it, it, it's a similar answer that we've had to other questions on this matter. It, it goes down to the basic standards of care that we, we have an expectation for all animals. And I think, um, you know, given the importance that sled dogs have in particular to Inuit culture, uh, I would just encourage that when we do take action on this, that we make sure that there is a very strong and firm engagement with Inuit in, in trying to tackle this, because I know that sled dogs are very important uh, to their culture. I think there's an expectation for a standard of care, but I think that, you know, we need to have that nation to nation approach when we approach issues like this as well. 
I want to talk about special caucuses on Parliament Hill. Some are called the Outdoor Caucus, the Rural Caucus, and they often consist of MPs or senators who are particularly responsive to lobbying from animal use industries. And they've been successful in keeping most animal protection laws weak, whether they relate to animal agriculture or not. It somehow always seems to end up there, these arguments. So special caucuses are allowed to keep their membership lists hidden from citizens, making it hard to know the intentions of our representatives. Will you promote transparency by supporting the, supporting the end of secrecy of these membership lists? Whoever wants to jump in here. Yeah, I'm really surprised the membership lists. I mean, I don't know how my colleagues feel. This had never occurred to me that the lists weren't public. Mm -hmm. I belong to, I, I helped start the All Party Climate Caucus. We have an All Party, as we've talked about, Animal Protection Caucus. We have an, uh, I'm the chair of the All Party Democracy Caucus. I'm involved with the Canada Palestinian Parliamentary Friendship Group. As far as I know, all of our membership lists. Are, are easily accessible. I didn't know the, I when I first was elected, I thought, oh, the Outdoors Caucus, I should join that. I, I definitely uh, was the only one there who was um, not keen on the uh, main preoccupations of my colleagues, but I figured I like being outdoors, I'll join this caucus. Yes, all those lists should be public. Go ahead, Mr. Erskine Smith. So I don't think any of us should be shy about a caucus that we join. I mean, we should be transparent in our activities to those who elect us, and we shouldn't be shy about what we participate in on Parliament Hill. And I, on the animal welfare side, I would say it would also be helpful to push members of all parties to join an all-party animal welfare caucus, and it would be great for a voter to go and say, oh, has my member joined? And these caucuses... Are, I don't want to oversell the impact all party caucuses have, but they are really important to build bridges to ensure that we take the politics out of some issues to ensure that we see progress. And we, we saw my experience in 2016 as an example that I had yet to build bridges because I had just been elected with conservative members and there was a ton of misinformation spread in, about that bill by conservative colleagues, unfortunately. And it would have been very helpful to have an all-party caucus at that time to hash things out. The Canadian Federation of Agriculture, as an example, said, yeah, of course, we'd be open to an all-party special committee on animal welfare and, and hash out these issues. And so I think there, there is a, a really important, a real importance, I would say, to ensuring that voters can hold us accountable in the end. Go ahead, Alistair. Yeah, quickly, not, to be, not, not to belabor <laughs> the point, I, I wasn't aware that these membership lists were secret either. And, you know, I, I echo Nathaniel, like, you know, if you're going to join a caucus, be proud of it, you know, explain to your constituents why you've joined that caucus, why it's furthering the goals of your constituents, or, you know, what your what personal reasons you have. So yeah, absolutely. Any any one of these membership lists should be open and transparent for all Canadians to see. This will be our last question of the evening. And uh, I, I think some of you have probably touched on it already, but we'll throw it out there anyway. And that is what single policy would have the greatest impact on animal welfare in your mind? And whoever wants to go first, please raise your hand and the floor will be yours. Go ahead, Ms. May. One minute. I have a broken <laughs> record on this. We need to reform our animal protection legislation in a, in a comprehensive and holistic way. We need to, I believe again, put animal protection in the criminal code, which is federal legislate, which is federal jurisdiction that gets us out of the business of agriculture is provincially regulated and we can't get involved. We need to be reasonable as we go forward so we don't alienate people to the extent that they will stop us but we must not uh, compromise on these key issues. The measure of our society as Canadians, uh, the, our, our sense of who we are, our compassionate selves at our heart level, we know we need to do better to take care of the non-human beings with whom we share this planet at all levels and in every way we possibly can. Mr. Erskine Smith. I agree that we need national animal protection legislation that is comprehensive and that we don't see then 
legislation to ban cosmetic testing or to protect animals in captivity. And it's in fits and starts and it's all over the place and it's hard to get on the legislative agenda as a result. But I would say that the biggest change we can make is to operationalize the food guide. And when I think of human health, including pandemic risk, when I think of climate action, and of course, when I think about animal rights and animal welfare and animal protection, I mean, when it's great that we are banning the captivity of cetaceans, that we ban the captivity of cetaceans, that we've taken action in the criminal code to address sexual abuse and animal fighting, that we've prohibited the shark fin trade. It's, it's wonderful that we are going to ban cosmetic testing on animals, ban the live export of horses and on and on. There is progress being made, has been made. We're going to protect and build on that progress. But the billions of animals that go through industrial animal agriculture, the way you address that is by oper operationalizing the food guide and transforming our food systems. Did you want to weigh in here, Mr. McGregor? Yeah, I don't have much to add. I mean, the, the strongest power we have as federal politicians is the federal criminal law power, uh, whether that is uh, shown through an amendment to the criminal code or through uh, other legislation that relates to agriculture. It's still a power that we have as the federal government to prohibit a certain activity uh, and to attach some punishments to it. So in whatever form that comes, that is the greatest power we have uh, from the federal side of things. And I'm afraid that is all the time we have. It is amazing how quickly an hour and a half will blow by. Uh, I guess time flies when you're having fun. Um, and I know that this 90 minute event is just able to scratch the surface of all the animal issues that we're facing in Canada. So I apologize to those of you whose questions get, didn't get addressed tonight. I've been seeing them blown by on the chat and I know there's a lot that we haven't gotten to. Um, we do encourage you to follow up with candidates in your writing um, and nationally to ask questions that be, may still be lingering on your mind. Um, and before we wrap up, I want to give each of the candidates just 30 seconds because I'm looking at the time. Um, with, if, if there was a final thought you wanted to leave on here that we hadn't touched on yet, but something that's on your mind that you wanted to put out there. Mr. Erskine Smith, fire away. This gets at the, I want to close about effectiveness in politics. And uh, I think if you're in Elizabeth May's writing, she's an incredible voice for animals, for the environment. And I, I have no qualms with supporting Elizabeth May. I think she's great. I hope she's a continued colleague. But I would say, I spoke to Peter Singer and I had, I had him on a podcast and we chatted and he's involved in the Green Party in Australia. And I said, you know, in the system in which we live, would you be a Green Party member in Canada? And he said, no. And it really comes down to where can we make the biggest difference? And have we made the, the biggest difference over the last six years? No, but we have a plant-based food guide and we push back against lobbying interests in, for the sake of science. We put money on the table to support the plant-based food sector. We've made changes to the criminal code, banned shark fin trade. We've, we've put promises on the table to do so much more. And I just ask you to, to consider who is your candidate for the Liberal Party? Are they gonna stand up for animals? Ask them that question. I have so many wonderful colleagues who will, and I encourage you to support them. Go ahead, Ms. May. I'm not going to be partisan. Obviously, I think the Green Party candidate in every riding is the right candidate because they we, we work from the grassroots up and nobody tells us what to do. But the reason that I wanted to take the floor again was to thank the enormous number of people who signed on to this webinar, almost a thousand people through tonight's debate. I want to thank Animal Justice and World Protection for Animals and, I'm, and you, Holly, but all the, uh, the list of groups that, that are part of putting this forward in a coalition sense, I just can't thank you enough. And I sometimes joke about it. I mean, I've had a lot of um, rescue animals over my life, but it, um, right now I feel as though uh, in an election campaign, my dog has a rescue human. I'm really glad that my companion animal is so, so, cheer is so good at cheering me up. So I wanna thank all of you out there for continuing to fight for animal protection and to keep it up and don't let anyone off the hook. Mr. McGregor, final word from you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I can tell from uh, some of the comments that uh, maybe not everyone on here is, is the, a fan of some of the policies that I'm following, but I guess what my commitment to you is, is that um, I've always uh, uh, come to politics with an open mind and a willingness to learn. And I, I believe this sincerely of every elected official. We, we are all trying our best to represent our communities and try to 
to plot the best way forward. And where the politics comes into play is that we just sometimes have different ideas on how to achieve those very same goals. Where, where I will end though is, you know, activists in Canadian society and to our democracy are incredibly important. So to everyone who's watching this, uh, I wanna thank you for your commitment. I know this is an extremely important issue to you. And I would just encourage you stay active during this election, but more importantly, stay active after the election. It's important that our democracy is not just about election versus election. It's that time in between that's also incredibly important. So thank you for giving us this opportunity, a very important discussion, and uh, hope everyone has a good next couple of weeks. <laughs> thank you each for that. Um, the election is now only just over one week away on September 20th. It's kind of crazy how quickly that's come. And on behalf of the organizers, here is your reminder to go out and vote. Advanced polls are open all day tomorrow. You have until 6 p.m. on Tuesday to request a mail-in ballot. And of course, there is election day itself if you want to be there on the day to do the deed. I wanna thank each of our three candidates for taking the time tonight to be here with us this evening. And of course, all of you uh, watching at home, chatting the entire time and being a part of Canada's first ever election debate on animal issues. Thank you so much and have a good night.